Good morning and welcome. We are so glad that you've joined us today. Before we open up in a word of prayer, we would like to say a very happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers out there listening. We love you. We appreciate you for all that you do and all that you mean to us. May today God bless you in a unique and special way. Now, please join me as we open up this service in a word of prayer. Father, we are delighted to come in and gather around our televisions, our phones, our computers, whatever it may be, with one objective, to lift up your son, Jesus Christ. We pray today as we do that, your presence would fill our hearts. Lord Jesus, through this season, we have been reminded continuously that you are with us always. You have never left us. You have never forsaken us just as you promised, and we praise you and honor you for that. We ask that today, through the worship, through the word, that the body of Christ would be lifted up and strengthened. May all that is done bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus, for it's in his name we pray today. Amen. And all of the church says, amen. Praise God. Join us this morning as we worship together. Yes, let's praise him. Come on. worthy of our praise, Father. Who am I that the highest King would welcome me? I was a lost, but He brought me in, oh, His love. me. 
on, let's sing together. Cause you are way maker, miracle worker, the promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are, you are way maker, miracle worker, the promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Come on, let's sing it out.
right there where you're at, just join us as we go to the Lord in prayer. We want to continue to pray for our nation, our leaders. We want to pray for the church of Jesus Christ. In fact, this morning, I just feel led that we should, we should pray for a revival, for awakening to come. You know, there's, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that out of this season that we've gone through as a church and as a people, God is working something out for good, something good for the kingdom, something good for the church. And so I think we should just begin even now to be praying, Lord, whatever that is, we, we want your will to be done. And there's no question today that it's God's will for family members to be saved, for communities to be transformed, for there to be genuine awakening to the realities of Scripture. And so let's pray that together. Uh, before we do, but we'll begin today praying for our nation, praying for our leaders, and then we'll just kind of finish praying for a true and genuine awakening. Father, we thank you this morning for every leader that is in our life. Lord, that's hard for us to say sometimes, but we know what your word says. In Romans, the 13th chapter, you tell us very clearly that all positions of authority have been placed there by your hand. And so today, we lift up every leader from the national level, federal, national level, down, Lord God, to the local and county level. We lift up our president, President Trump, Vice President Pence, Lord, all of their advisors. We specifically remember the COVID-19 task force, Lord, that has so many people involved. We pray that, Lord, only good and wise counsel will be given to the president. We pray, Lord God, that you would bless them and strengthen them through this season of great difficulty. Lord, we pray for every member of the Senate, every Congress man or woman. We pray that, God, you'd give them strength and guidance and direction as well. We pray that, Lord, you would break through the partisanship, the vitriol and the anger, the jealousy, the frustration that is evident among our leaders. Father God, we ask that you would come and begin to shatter those things and that there would be a unity that only you can bring, a unity that would begin to flow out of the halls of Congress and the Senate and the White House and flow into the streets of our nation. This morning, we lift up Governor Holcomb and all of those leaders in the state of Indiana. We pray that you'd bless them we pray that you'd give them wisdom as well and guidance. Those at the county level, we pray for them. Strengthen. Again, Father, we look to you to give wisdom. Lord, we pray that you would touch the hearts of every leader, that, that their intentions would be good and not evil. That, Lord, where there is evil, that it would be exposed and would be dealt with so that righteousness and justice and goodness can prevail and the people of God could be blessed. We pray, even as you tell us in your word for our leaders, so that it may be well for us. In other words, so that the church can function the way you intended us to function. We lift up the church of Jesus Christ today and we pray, Lord God, for a genuine revival. Oh, how we need it, Lord. We pray that you would send the rain of your glory and presence to the people of God, that you would strengthen us and encourage us now, that you would fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. We pray for an awakening to come to our community that multitudes, hundreds upon hundreds, would give their lives and their hearts to Jesus Christ. We specifically remember our loved ones and family members who don't know you as Lord and Savior. Today, Lord God, may you send the Holy Spirit to them. Open their spiritual eyes and let their ears begin to hear the call, the mercy call of God drawing them home. May it become very real and very known that, Lord God, you are for them and not against them and that you have come to redeem them. We pray that souls would be saved. We pray for Southeast Indiana that multitudes of souls would be saved. I pray, Lord God, for this church specifically, that, Lord, out of this season of dryness would come a great season of abundance and harvest. 
We pray that, Lord, when we're able, that the seats in this church would be full to capacity, that hundreds upon hundreds would come and give their lives and hearts to Jesus Christ, that they would be baptized, that they would confess faith in Jesus Christ, that there would be true transformation. Lord God, we ask this now in the name of Jesus. We trust your word that all things work together for good. And therefore, we pray that, Lord, out of these eight weeks of us being away and being separated and not being able to come into the house of God, we pray that, Lord, great good would come out of it. That we would come out of it stronger, purer, closer to Christ than we've ever been. Lord, we lift up every one of our church family right now and we ask you, Lord God, to bless them. We ask you to bless their families. We pray for any that are sick. May you heal their bodies. In fact, Lord, we lift up specifically those that are dealing with the coronavirus, even now, whether in our church or outside of the church, we pray, Lord, for your healing. We pray that you would touch their bodies. And Lord, of course, we know that there are others that are dealing with many different sicknesses and Ill illnesses as well. May you touch them. May you heal them. May you comfort them even this morning. Father, we give you the glory and the praise. And all of this we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. Praise God. At this time, we ask you to watch our announcements. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Ben. Thanks for joining us this Sunday. This is your weekly announcements. If you haven't heard already, we are going to be resuming our in-person services starting on May 17th. We will have more information regarding these services as the week progresses. But just so you know, we will be practicing social distancing. Tuesday, May 19th, we will be having a Celebrate Recovery meeting in person. And if you don't know, Celebrate Recovery is a program that helps individuals with their hurts, their habits, and their hangups. And just a side note, the CR meeting will be held in the main sanctuary, not in the annex. We will be having two food pantries in the month of May, being on the 11th and the 18th from 6 to 8 p.m. So please stay in your vehicles as this will be a drive through pantry. That's all we have for you this week. If you miss anything, check the description because everything I talked about will be in there. Thanks for joining us this morning and we'll see you next week. Okay, by now you know that next Sunday is going to be our first in-person service in over eight weeks. I don't know about you, but I am extremely excited. But during these last eight weeks, a lot has happened both in the natural and in the spiritual realm. As you know, during seasons of trial and difficulty, the enemy loves to come and expose weaknesses and take advantage in any way that he can. This season has been no different. In fact, in the face of the unknown, fear, anxiety, frustration, and anger, there has been a subtle and unseen attack that is taking place on the Christian and the church at large. It is an attack on our focus, an attack on our love for one another, and an attack on our unity, all of which are hugely important to the success of the Church of Jesus Christ. I read a news article this week, and it read this. Americans are divided, clashing over masks. Now, of course, this was an article referencing the decision whether or not you and I should wear masks in public. It was an interesting article because as the leadership of the church has been gathering over the last few weeks and deciding on how to best reopen the church, the discussions of mask has come up often. And I want you to know that in those discussions, I have found that over 20 of our leaders are divided as well. There are many that think masks are important, and when we gather in church services, we should wear them, while others believe we shouldn't. It's just fine. We should be people of faith and not necessarily really worry about wearing a mask. Maybe they aren't that necessary. Fortunately, though, I am surrounded by loving, mature Christian people. And during these times of discussion and even debate, 
none of us allowed this topic to hinder our relationship. It was a fantastic endeavor of just bringing out ideas and thoughts and discussion. Some of them were adamant about their position, but never have we allowed it to bring a wedge of div division or disunion in between us. It simply became a matter of this. Some of us will wear masks and some of us will not, but we will remain unified. I was so proud of the leaders, the elders and leaders of this church as we made that decision. And that's what you will see next week. Some of them will wear masks and some of them won't. And it's okay either way. Guess what? The scripture doesn't tell us whether you should wear a mask or you shouldn't. So if you choose to do that, great. And if you choose not to, it's okay. But what it, this is, is really a microcosm of what is happening across society as we speak. And that is the enemy's efforts to build a wedge between each of us. Remember, Jesus Christ told us very clearly in the word of God. He says, to love one another. And by this love, all will know that you are my disciples, if in fact you have love for one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 reveals clearly what some of the major characteristics of love are. Let me read you a couple of verses. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4, it says this, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself and is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely and does not seek its own. Is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. I want you to notice this passage of scripture. Love is patient with others. Church, we need to hear that right now. Love is kind, and it is characteristically kind even to those who do not believe the way we do. Let me remind you of Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 5. If you want to turn there in Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 43, Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. I want you to hear what Jesus is saying. This is a very tough and difficult teaching from the mouth of our Savior. He says very clearly that we are to love those who not only are different than us and don't believe the way we do, but he takes it as far as to say we should love those who use us, who are spiteful against us, and who even persecute us. He says that by this we shall be known as the sons of the Father. The church of Jesus Christ needs this now. We need to recognize that we wage war not in the natural with one another. We do not have flesh and blood enemies. Our warfare takes place in the spiritual realm. If you go back to 1 Corinthians 13, you'll see that love not only is, is it kind and um, giving towards others, but love is not puffed up or arrogant. Sometimes our knowledge of God and of the Bible can actually work against us as it begins to create a sense of superiority. I'm amazed at Christians who use social media platforms and scripture to browbeat and try to win a debate against those who are not of the same mind and opinion. Remember this, a know-it-all attitude is only evidence of our arrogance. Listen, as followers of Jesus Christ with enlightenment to the word of God, we see and understand things that other people don't. That is true. 
But we must not allow that to create a superiority attitude, a holier-than-thou mentality. Paul the Apostle himself said, we see through a glass darkly. In other words, yes, we're given insight to things that, that, that we could never have or never understand without the Scripture and without the Holy Spirit within us. But make no mistake, we don't have all the answers. We don't know every nuance. We are people of faith. We have trust in our Heavenly Father. We cannot live our lives going around acting as if we know it all. That's not what love does. It says that love does not behave itself rudely. Boy, that spoke to me this week. As I'm watching an attitude permeate in our culture, a, an attitude of uh, where people just simply believe it's okay to be disrespectful. It's okay to be rude. It's okay to live as if we have no civility at all. Listen to me. As Christians, you and I must not fall into this trap. You are different. You are a called and chosen person by God. You are a Christian. You are a new creation in Jesus Christ. We have been called out of that old lifestyle. We, we, others may be able to, but you and I cannot. We are given a higher call. You and I represent someone and something that is far beyond the natural eye, far beyond the natural realm. You and I represent Jesus Christ and his kingdom. We must not lose sight of that during this very stressful and difficult season. Now, not only is our love being attacked, but so is our focus. Look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Jesus read these words as he began his earthly ministry. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and to the recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, these words were spoken and prophesied thousands of years before Jesus Christ even entered the scene. And yet, as he begins his earthly ministry, he walks into the temple, he opens the scroll of Isaiah, and he reads this, and he says, Today, these words are fulfilled in your ears. And so, in many ways, what we have here in these verses is a uh, capturing of the gospel. It begins to reveal to us the gospel or what is known as the good news. The good news, what is it? The good news is that the poor can be reached. Healing could come to the brokenhearted. Captives can be set free. Blind eyes can be opened. Multitudes can know that God is not against them, but rather God is for them. So much so that he sent his son to the earth to redeem them. That is the good news. That is the ministry of Jesus Christ. And as followers of Jesus, we have been given the power of the Holy Spirit to represent him and further this ministry while on earth. That should be and must be the focus of the church of Jesus Christ. Sadly, today, much of our focus has been placed in different areas. Let me be very real and very honest with you. There are many noble causes today to align yourself with. There's no question. But none of them compare to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. None of them. I understand. I am not naive, as many of you are not as well, to the fact that right now we are watching civil liberties be stripped right out from under us. We are watching as our Constitution is being polluted on all levels. I understand that. The nation that our parents grew up in is not the nation that our children is going to grow up in. That's the reality. And I know it causes frustration and anger and discontentment. But make no mistake, it is nothing more than a scheme of the enemy to loot, for you and I as the church of Jesus Christ to lose focus on what Jesus has called us to do and be. Jesus has called us to be about the Father's business. Don't forget today that people all around us are lost and dying and going to an eternity without God. Our high calling is to spread the good news of Jesus 
to reach out to those that are spiritually bound, those that are spiritually blind, those that are hurting and broken, those that are addicted and in chains. You and I hold the good news of Jesus Christ, and it is our responsibility as the church to share it. Not only to share it, but to live it and to allow our light to shine to the world around us. Do not get caught in the fray of what's happening. It is not your responsibility, nor is it mine, to defend any other kingdom but the kingdom which will last for all of eternity, and that is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. When you became a follower of Christ, you relinquished your citizenship and your, and, and your adherence to every other kingdom, and you set your affection on things that are eternal, not on things that are temporal. Don't forget it, and don't allow Satan to steal your focus. The third area of attack is our unity. Now clearly, as Christians, we do not all agree on every part of the scripture. But we must be willing to rally around the cross of Jesus Christ and the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ that is sufficient to save us from our sin. Other believers are not the enemy. I want to say that again. Other believers and other Christian churches are not our enemy. As we move forward, churches over, over, the, over all this area are going to choose to open at different times. There's going to be a lot of difficult decisions that pastors are going to make as they seek God and as they think it's the best decision. They're going to, they're going to make decisions based on what they think is best for their community, for their congregation, and the like. Let's respect each other during the process. Come on, let's be the bigger, mature people. Let's just respect however they choose to do it, just like we talked about with masks. Like, whatever. Does it really matter to you if someone else wears a mask and if someone else doesn't? It's, it's, it's your choice and it's okay. But let's respect one another. Let's embrace one another during this period of time. The Bible tells us clearly that when God's people choose to walk in unity that he will command a blessing upon us. And at the end of the day, folks, that is what we need. We need God's blessing. Now, in the book of Acts, we're given this fa a fantastic model of all of this. It was during a very difficult time of persecution. While Christians are being scattered across the region, many are losing their possessions. They're, they're even watching their family members be thrown into prison. And some of them were even being murdered for their faith in Jesus Christ. And as all of this is happening, the Bible tells us that the Lord adds to the church daily. Or in other words, we see what we would refer to today as a revival. I want you to see it in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Let's read it together. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 through 47. It says, then those who gladly received his word were baptized that day. About 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. I want you to look at me for just a moment. I want you to notice that 42nd verse as we just stop there for a moment. It says that the Christians continued steadfastly. Now, we read that and we think, well, that's great. They did what they were called to do. They were about the Father's business. They did what God was, was leading them and directing them to do, which is the model that we're supposed to be following as well. But I want you to understand the backstory. Things were not great in their everyday life. No, there was a great persecution that was taking place. There, there was pressure on all sides from the authorities of that day, not only from from the ungodly pagan authorities, the Roman authorities, but also from the religious authorities of that day. And so there was persecution and struggle and stress and, and hardship on every level. But the Christians, under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit, chose to be steadfast in a number of things. Studying the scripture, fellowshipping together, breaking bread, and praying. Notice, they did not get in the petition line petitioning the local government. They didn't fight for their rights or whatever it was that was such a struggle for the day. They weren't out picketing the high taxes and the corruption of the tax collectors. No, they're Christians. They were a part of a whole other world now. They were living as otherworldly beings. You see, that's the call of the church of Jesus Christ. 
We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're to represent heaven. Go back to the 43rd verse and let's read. It says, then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. Of course, this speaks of unity. And they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as everyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord, there it is again, unity. In the temple and breaking of bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I can't help as we read this and as I look over it to think we all desire the church to grow, for the church to expand, for our family members to be saved, for our, for our neighbors to be saved, for our co-workers to come to know Jesus Christ as, our, as their Lord and Savior. But, but I can't help but wonder if God's not waiting on us to begin to walk in unity and get our focus back. And at the moment, we're able to just simply do that and follow the Bible with simplicity of heart, then God will do what he's promised to do which is add to the church. He will build the church. He will save our loved ones and family members. He will do what only he can do. Folks, unity is imperative, and you and I must model it in the hour in which we're living. Now, in closing, I just want to quote a verse of Scripture. You can turn there later if you'd like. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Maybe in the next few weeks as we come back together, we'll start kind of doing a study in Romans chapter 8, or I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians. If I said Romans, I was wrong. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. But, but in 1 Corinthians 8, there's just this great teaching from the Apostle Paul, kind of in line with a lot of the things that we're talking about. But in the ninth verse, it says this, beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. Church of Jesus Christ, I want you to hear those words. I want you to hear them one more time. Paul says to us, beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. Now, Paul, of course, in context, was referring to our spiritual liberty in Christ. He was referring to the fact that we live by grace and we do not live under the law. I understand that. But I I want you to know that this applies to you and I today. A stumbling block is anything that prevents progress. And if you and I find ourselves fighting small, insignificant battles in all different arenas and all different areas, we become susceptible to Satan. We become weakened in our endeavors. And we literally begin to be a stumbling block to all the things that God wants to do. And I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be a stumbling block to the progress of the coming of the kingdom of God. I don't want to be a stumbling block to my neighbors, my fellow citizens, my, my fellow countrymen as it is. I don't, I don't want to be a stumbling block to them coming to Christ. You see, whether you like it or not, people are watching the church during this season. And, and every time we are posting and acting out in anger and frustration and in the flesh, it belittles, it becomes a stumbling block to the church of Jesus Christ. That's the reality. I know it's hard, I know it's difficult, but that is the truth. You and I need to be focusing daily on what Christ has called us to do. For us... Let me make this very clear, and this is not my opinion, this is not Bridge of Hope opinion, this is not denominational opinion, this is biblical reality that can't be denied. If you are a true follower of Jesus Christ, progress is serving the king and advancing his kingdom, period. There is no other call, there is no other agenda. It is advancing the kingdom of God. It is spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. It is reaching the poor, the broken, the marginalized, the hurting with the blessed hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's living as lights in a dark and broken world. Don't be a stumbling block. No, instead, rise to this occasion. I pray and believe that we're going to. 
I know as we get ready to come back together, there's going to be all sorts of different thoughts and opinions about how we should have done it, when we should have done it, why this, why that, mask, not mask, all of that stuff. But folks, if, if we're going to just begin to be what God has called us to be, we're just going to have to lay a lot of those things to the side, make our decisions, go with them, but trust God to get us back into focus of what he's called us to do and be. I want you to know that this church, we love you. We honor you. And for those of you that are going to choose to not come back on the 17th because you have underlying health issues or maybe you're 65 and over or maybe, maybe you're just not comfortable yet, we love you. We're, we're not going to belittle you. We're not going to look down on you. We, we, we are going to welcome you whenever the day comes when you're ready to come back home. We're not going to tout ourselves as somehow more spiritual than you because we come to church because that's not reality. No, we're all in this together. We're going to walk in unity. We're going to love one another, and we're going to stay focused. Amen? Praise God. Cannot wait to see you next week. For those of you that are going to be joining us for the rest, we're still going to have online services for you to enjoy. And so uh, God bless you. Can't wait to see you. Have a fantastic day.